Hello, and welcome to an insider's look at business acquisition and growth. My name is Brendan Freeman, and I'm the president of Private Wealth for First Business Bank. In today's panel discussion, we're going to focus on acquiring another company and some success around that process. Whether you're considering growing for geographic expansion or to enhance your workforce, we think you'll find this discussion enlightening. Some of the topics that we're going to include today are comparing company cultures to make sure that they're a good fit, preparing and organizing ahead of the negotiation stage, and then lastly, evaluating partnerships with business experts to make sure that you have excellent long-term success. So without any further discussion, let's jump right in. I'm very excited to talk with this incredible group of business professionals that we have gathered to talk about business growth and hear from some business owners who have been successful with mergers and acquisitions. Thank you to the business owners Greg Jones from Dave Jones Inc., Louis Lang III from the Commonwealth Companies, and attorney Matthew Peterson from Godfrey and Khan for joining us. Matthew, the attorney is often a, a crucial team player in business transactions. Can you introduce yourself and your practice and what your role would be in a merger or acquisition? Sure. Yeah, I'm Matthew Peterson. I'm a shareholder at Godfrey and Kahn. I'm in our corporate practice group, which is kind of an umbrella term um, uh, for our transactional practice group. Uh, I, I would say I spend at least 80% of my time representing buyers and sellers in M&A transactions. So that's really a focus, um, you know, of our of our corporate transactional group here, and certainly a focus of my practice. Greg, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your business and the successes that you've had expanding into new business lines? Sure, good morning. Yeah, my name is Greg Jones. I'm the president and CEO at Dave Jones Incorporated. Thank you for having me. We are a plumbing, HVAC, electrical, and fire protection subcontractor, uh, mostly in new construction, but we also do service and remodel for residential and commercial companies. We've done a number of mergers and acquisitions over my career. Uh, we've had a lot of organic growth as well. So we have experience in both, but our most recent acquisition was our first out-of-state acquisition, which was a plumbing company in Indianapolis. Awesome. I'd love to hear more about that. We'll flip it to Louie to introduce yourself. You've been growing the Commonwealth companies for 20 years. Can you talk a little bit about the successes that you've had and share a little bit about the company? Sure. Um, we're a Fond du Lac-based company that specializes in affordable housing, all aspects of affordable housing, I would say, as we're fully integrated. The tip of the spear for us is the development arm. Um, we have in-house architecture. We construct our own properties uh, across the United States. Um, we're in 21 states at this point, as well as uh, property management arm. We've done a lot of de novo offices by adding developers throughout the uh, throughout the country, but most recently, um, the end of 2018, I did a, a strategic merger um, with Commonwealth, our platform companies, not the actual projects that were developed up until that date. Again, just to kind of take us into that next stage of the business, um, I'm trying to think a little bit long term. The projects that we have have long life cycles. 15-year compliance periods with investors, and and I'm 52, and I actually had to start thinking about an exit strategy. So I think that was actually a, a good thing on, on my part, and I had a lot of lessons learned on that. Um, I also have what I call a, a, a bit of a side hustle, a, um, a, a dental service organization with my, my brother-in-law as a dentist, so I, I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. Um, so we'd, we have a subject matter expert in that area. We started that in 2013, um, and the idea is that you purchase dental practices from retiring dentists, probably try and get them three to five years before they're uh, retiring, put in a robust business function behind those, create a group, get the economies of scale of a large larger organization, but still have the same uh, neighborhood dentist dental office feel. Um, and so we've acquired uh, 18 different dental practices in the state of Wisconsin. Um, Greg, you mentioned that your company has grown both organically and through acquisitions. Can you talk a little bit about the characteristics of the current labor market that led you to acquiring a smaller company, especially one out of state, rather than hiring and training? Yeah, the labor market for us is incredibly tight. Um, but we look at every situation as being unique. Uh, we have done a number of initiatives where we'll grow a new area of our, our company organically. But recently, um, it's it's been all about acquisition. And 
for Indianapolis, it was a plumbing company, which we obviously have a lot of knowledge in that area, but it was our first acquisition out of state. And so for that, we felt like being able to acquire a really great company that we could build a strong platform on um, was the right way to go for us to be able to go out and especially skilled labor. Construction labor is very hard to find. There's a, a shortage nationwide on skilled labor. We felt like being able to acquire a great company and having that platform would allow us to scale much more quickly than if we had tried to do it organically. And our acquisitions before that were the same thing. It was a little bit different in which we were adding a new service instead of a new area. Um, we added electrical to our plumbing, HVAC, and fire protection trades, but it was the same thing. It was really about acquiring people and talent than it was acquiring a book of business or anything of that nature. Um, we felt like to get where we wanted to go, we needed to add great people and great talent and acquisition was the best way for us to do that because our, our number one resource is our people. And as I mentioned, the labor market's very tough. And as we try to grow our existing trades, we're really growing that from the ground up. We're growing that with people who have great attitudes and want a great career. And then we train them from there. Going out and adding skilled, experienced labor uh, in today's market is very, very tough to do. But I, I do think we'll continue to do a mix of that in the future. It'll just depend on, on each unique situation. Louis, I know that the Commonwealth Companies is based in Fond du Lac, and you recently merged with a Madison-based company. How do you go about determining whether the company you're merging with or the people are a good fit with your existing company? Or what's the process and what professional advisors did you have to make that decision? I think first and foremost, when you're looking at a, a merger, and again, I had a, a couple of people buy into our, our platform company, the development company and the um, construction company. First and foremost, I say you have to have a good fit with the people that you're you're bringing in the people that are going to sit across the table from you, especially in a merger compared to an acquisition where I look at that and say, you are going to be the guy or the gal at, at the top. Um, but a merger where you're leading by committee, uh, you better have a good fit um, with the people. So the reason it worked for us is frankly, we were already, um, we were already constructing my partner's uh, projects. We were managing their projects. We were designing their projects. So we had a track record. So when and if possible, I guess I would say that that's probably the best litmus test for is this a good partnership? Are you able to execute on projects prior to really taking that big plunge? As far as outside sources, I think that's probably where we drop the ball a bit in terms of using uh, technical experts, which is kind of a rule of thumb for me to execute the transaction. We used our in-house counsel. He's a great guy, a smart guy, but that's just not his area of expertise. Matthew, go ahead. You should start putting your hand up right now and uh, <laughs> taking a bow and say exactly why you need somebody like myself. Um, because you end up undoing, fixing things. I'm not going to say undo, but you know we didn't have all the um, questions answered. We didn't even think of all the questions. Um, and then I know later on we're going to talk a little bit about estate planning and some things like that. The way that that layers in with all of this is very, very important. So I would highly recommend that you go out and, and, and get people to know what they're doing in these spaces. It's just going to save you time and money long term, a lot of headaches. Greg, you and I have spoke about how important company culture is to you. And so I'm curious when you're going out and looking at acquiring a company, especially one out of state, what have you done to both affirm that the company is a good fit and also to sort of calm employee fears about mergers? Having been an employee in a position where a company was potentially merging, I know there was a lot of fear and uncertainty about the changes that might come. How have you addressed that? Yeah, it's really, it's everything. Uh, and we've certainly learned some lessons from mistakes we've made in the past um, that we've applied going forward. But you know, Warren Buffett's got a great quote, you can't make a good deal with a bad person. And I think that's 100% true. I think the person that you're acquiring is just as important, if not more, than the company itself. And I would go even further and say that you can't make a good deal with the wrong culture. And it starts on the front end with the business owners. And we've spent a lot of time, especially on our most recent acquisition in Indianapolis, just talking with 
um, Kathy. It's her name is Kathy from Indianapolis, and and getting to know her business philosophy and her getting to know ours and having those discussions. Our first few meetings were all about that. How do we view the world? How do we view our business? How do we view our team members? And we knew that within a few meetings that we were on the same page and and price never came up. It was never about price um, until we both knew that one, she would trust her company with us and, and two, we felt like her company would be a great culture fit with ours. And I just feel that if you can't get to that point, you should walk away because it, it's not going to work. It's going to be incredibly challenging. It's probably an acquisition that is just not going to work for you. And then price was the easy part from there. Um, we both came to an agreement very quickly on, on what fairness was. And so that's really the first step is deciding that it is the right culture fit and that you do want to move forward with it. And then from there, you have to execute. And we took a lot of additional steps with Indianapolis that we had not taken before. And it really started with dividing and conquering amongst our leadership team. And so what we did was on day one of the acquisition, Holly, my business partner and sister and I met with their entire company and really talked about um, for almost an hour, talked about who we are and, and what our values are and what our company values are and what our long-term goals were for us and for them and, and for us together. And from there, we spent the rest of the week making sure that we didn't leave Indianapolis until we had an opportunity to meet every single employee, either individually or in a small group, and to be able to answer any question or any fear that they have, uh, to let them get to know us on a personal level, uh, for us to get to know them on a personal level, uh, to be vulnerable, you know, there were very personal discussions that came out and we let the rest of our team handle um, customer meetings and supplier meetings and, and advisor meetings. Um, that was not our priority. Our priority was making sure that we were letting them get to know us and our culture was our number one thing. And, you know, we took additional steps such as assigning a mentor to each person in their office so that they would have someone at Dave Jones where they could reach out with questions or concerns or ideas and and those really became close friendships where they would talk and they would stay in touch and and they're doing that still today um, we also incorporated we have a performance coach at dave jones a, a third-party advisor who we also incorporated in indianapolis to help build a cohesive team and talk about the dave jones culture and what that means and and we were very fortunate. We we have not lost a single person in the company due to the acquisition, which is rare and, and very challenging to do. But I really think it it starts from making sure on the very front end that you have a culture fit between the two companies and then working very hard to to show that vision and, and to be vulnerable and, and to put yourself out there. Matthew, are there things that come up during the deal process that are surprising to business owners looking to acquire other companies, things during the due diligence process that maybe they weren't expecting? Uh, yeah, I would say in almost every transaction, something comes up that was unexpected. And it's and, and part of the reason I, I love doing what I do is you never know what that's going to be. So some transactions, you know, there might be an identified uh, environmental issue and the next one will be employee benefits and 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 you just never know. And so um, there's you always have to be prepared for the unknown and and how to handle it. Um, so you know one of the main things that I do uh, you know as an m and a professional, an m and a lawyer is first of all, you know especially on behalf of buyers, is first of all trying to identify these areas of risk. Um, but then really the, the meat of negotiating an M&A transaction, from my point of view, is allocating risk amongst buyers and sellers in a, in a way that's, you know, has, uh, th that balances the competing interests, right? So, so sellers, I think, fairly have a position of, well, part of the reason I'm selling my company uh, is to take chips off the table, right, and and kind of cash out and not sit there with, you know, looking over my shoulder for the for the rest of my life. Um, and buyers conversely have a similar position of, 
Well, when I decided, you know, when, when we agreed upon purchase price, for example, that assumed that the company, the target company was fairly clean, not perfectly squeaky clean, but fairly clean. You know, we were, we didn't say we're going to give you $25 million for this business um, and expect to find out you're dumping hazardous waste into the river out back, right? So there's there's this give and take of what's a fair allocation of risk between buyers and sellers. So that's really the role. And, and again, representing buyers, it's finding these areas during diligence and then making certain that the buyer can be in a, a, a position in which they have comfort that they can be made whole if and when post-closing liabilities rear their head. Hopefully they won't, but that really also takes two different forms. One is known and identifiable items, uh, you know, where diligence finds, hey, you, you, this company's a manufacturing company, it's supposed to have a wastewater discharge permit and an air permit, and it doesn't. That stuff's kind of easy. You can kind of get a box around it, but um, every company operating as a going concern also has a, a different bucket of just unknown risk at the time of closing. Everybody hopes that that bucket is not very full, but you never know. So the second part is, you know, there's there's negotiating the identified risks, and then there's negotiating the unknowns. Can I just add something to what Greg was saying, especially when you're, um, and I understand that he's done a lot of acquisitions as well. So uh, I guess I a bit of a contrarian view on something, and I'm I'm thinking about the dental space and the number of practices that we've acquired. And when you're trying to create a group that way, you're again you have 18 individual offices. They might have had a, a dental a dentist slash leader for the last 30, 40 years, a long time. <laughs> and I think what's when you start doing these on scale, you have to remember that you're merging a lot of cultures. And, and I think one of the hardest things to do and, and a wrong thing to do is to try and impose your culture on another organization. And that's what Greg is saying, make sure you have the right fit with that. But at the same time, I think one of the things that's important is to let the people know that um, you are gonna be different. It's okay to be different. Um, one of the things that makes us good is, or, or better is, is, is again a merger of those cultures and trying to take the best parts from all the organizations and create something bigger and better so i've always tried to i've always tried to lead with with that that and i love this uh this saying um and, and and i use it often that we reserve the right to get smarter um and as long as they know that i think that's that welcoming assurance they want to see it at the table they they understand things will change and, and things will change. That's the other thing. I think it's important to let them know it's not all going to be the same as it was before, but hopefully it's going to get, it's going to get better, not only for them, but for the company that's doing the acquiring. We want to learn from you. So I think as much as you can um, make that part of your culture and your dialogue, your communications, um, uh, that's a winning formula. Louis, I'm curious, I know that you were an officer in the Marines. Did your experience or um, things that you learned in the Marine Corps influence the way that you've built your business and its growth? Absolutely. I mean, being a former Marine was a pivotal point in my life, changed my life. So I, I'm, I absolutely attribute to where I am today because of that. And there's frankly too many lessons learned to share in one sitting. But, and, but I think about it every day and I talk about it every day. I think I've ad nauseum. I think for some people, you almost see their eyes roll back every once in a while. And I start to tell my old war stories here. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I really like to talk about is just basic leadership with as we've grown the organization. Um, and, and I try and step back and you put mid-level uh, leaders in place. I, I'm amazed that we have great people with great talent and technical skills, et cetera. But one of the things that I think is lacking and that you get from the military, especially the Marine Corps, is leadership training. So one of the things I guess I'd, I'd say that has been most important to pass along to to our people is the idea of, um, and this is pretty basic, everybody know, knows that you're supposed to do this, but know your people, their strengths and weaknesses, et cetera. Um, and that's easy in the technical sense, but what's more important um, as, as I like to put it, is you need to know who needs a hug and who needs a kick in the can and when they need it. Um, because you are trying, you're trying to move the needle with these companies, right? You're trying to make them better. You're trying to be the very best version of yourselves um, in this. And what a lot of these folks don't understand when I say that is they have to take that 
and understand that they need to change their leadership style. A lot of people think, oh, I have a leadership style. This is how I how I lead um, um, across the board. But it's a leader's job to adjust their leadership style to the people that they're leading. And, and that's, again, the importance of, of knowing who needs the hug and being able to give a hug and who needs the kick in the can and being able to deliver a kick in the can. So that's probably one of the greatest lessons that I've learned in the, um, and I attribute that one to a, a guy named, um, well, a general, Anthony Zinni. You may have, uh, I remember having, a, he had a little platoon leadership class with us, you know, a platoon level, which was pretty neat to have a, a three-star general sit down and, and and teach you things like that. But there's there's so many great things and there's a lot of great books out there that people can pick up and, and, and learn about those things. Um, you know, and I guess quickly I'd say another one I just, I mentioned earlier, task organization. Um, you learn that early on as well, that um, as an officer, um, you need to be in essence kind of a jack of all trades. And you need to have technical expertise, but don't, misunderstand that that you're going to have greater technical skills than the people that you're leading so your job is really is, is not to know more than they know your job is just to know that they know what they're supposed to know <laughs> and and ha have little testers and you know trust but verify and challenge the people that way um, and, and I think that's been that's been a, a really helpful skill again that I try and pass along because as you grow a business again I started my business in the basement I was chief cook and bottle washer but as you grow the business you have to start getting away from the doing if you will um, and that's that's I think a lot of businesses fail uh, because their leadership fails to do that. And, you know, that's the old uh, the, the Peter principle, right? You rise to the point of your incompetence because you don't change and you don't put people in place that are better than, than you are in those areas. So I think that's one of those are a couple of the greatest lessons I guess I take and I try and think about those things every day. I'm really glad I asked that question. That was a very interesting answer. Um, Greg, I'm curious, Dave Jones has been a company since 1977, which was the year I was born. Um, I imagine Jeez. over that- <laughs> You don't look a day over 85, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Louise. Yeah. Um, so Greg, Dave Jones has been in existence since 1977. I'm, I, I would imagine over time as the business grows, the team of professional advisors has to change and grow with the business. So you're- attorney or your your banker, your CPA. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the team changed over the years and how you were able to find the right team? Yeah, that's been very important to us. You know, our advisors, we call them our business partners, but they're part of our success. You know, they're part of our team. We look at them as if they're on our team at Dave Jones. And, you know, I remember sitting in a strategic planning session, it was at least 10 years ago, where we were talking about, you know, kind of what, who do we want to be when we grow up and what are our goals and what can we accomplish? And we recognized at that time that for us to be able to do that, we needed to have partners around us that were built for who we want to be and not who we were that day. And we made wholesale changes in our company um, with our bank, with our attorney, with our accountant, with our insurance agent. Um, at that time, we wanted people who were larger than us and smarter than us and had better contacts than we did. And it's it's really served us well. And over the last 10 to 15 years, we've built personal relationships with these people. And it's really helped us, especially doing acquisitions, because we bring them in on the front end um, as we're looking at businesses and and they give us their opinion and their advice and is crucial to what we've done. And and I would add that, you know, the external team is very important, but you also have to look at your internal team as well. And acquisitions are hard. They're very hard. And you have to have management depth and you have to have a leadership bench that you can rely on to be able to divide and conquer, like I talked about with Indianapolis, or to make sure that the core business is running effectively and successfully while you're turning your attention to a new acquisition. And so it's both, it's having great external advisors that you can rely on, but also having that internal depth to be able to divide and conquer and, and accomplish both at the same time. 
Dar, I'd, I'd add this to what, what Greg just said, and I think it's a great answer, and I wish I would have heard it years ago because um, <laughs> I felt like we were always a little behind on the curve. As a leader, you have to make tough choices as well. And sooner or later, you are going to, you know, we're talking about growing businesses, you do outgrow your partners. Other partners have certain niches and you have to, again, just like you have to recognize strengths and weaknesses of people, you have to re recognize the those in your in, in your business to business partners and and you have to be willing um, and able to make the tough choices of saying it's time to move on. And I would almost suggest that this we've had to do that so many times in the last 20 years, having that conversation up front, say we're looking for the right fit right now and we're going to grow. And um, because you do develop great relationships with these people, friends, and you don't want to burn any bridges because uh, you never know where, uh, you know, where you're, where you're going to meet next um, with those folks. But you should have those conversations because um, I, I've seen people that are kind of anchored by their partners and, and that doesn't make a lot of and that's not great partner. Partners should be telling you it's time to move on too. Yeah, I, I, I'd also, I think it's important to add and uh, agree with what, what both uh, Greg and Louie just said. It's also important to add on the acquisition side. Um, you know, we've got to, being cognizant of the of the M&A market we're in, which is very competitive, and, and you know, Greg and Louie would be on the strategic side of an acquisition, but talking about having your ducks in a row, having your advisor team in a, uh, you know, geared up and ready to go and competent to do sophisticated deal work is very important because you're competing with institutional buyers that have that when you're when you're looking at target companies to acquire. So when your competitors uh, in a market making bids on businesses, for example, are other private equity funds, family offices that do this uh, uh, you know, on a regular basis, they're going to have their ducks in a row. They're going to say, here's they're, they're going to come in and say, here's who's doing our quality of earnings report. Here's who's doing our environmental diligence. Here's our lawyer. And here's how we're going to you know, propose high level terms of a purchase agreement. So they're coming in with a package. Um, and so for strategic buyers, business owners looking at being acquisitive, it's important that you don't put yourself um, uh, at a disadvantage when compared to the other potential bidders on a target business. Right. I would imagine if you're an entrepreneur starting a business in your basement like Louis did, your general all-purpose lawyer is not necessarily the person that you want negotiating a major acquisition. So, Matthew, can you talk a little bit about your role in, in the life cycle of a business? Do you come in just for the transaction or do you continue to work with, with the business owner after? Yeah, the roles the roles change. There's certainly there's certainly one offs where you know just being at a large law firm and and, and having a well regarded M and A practice, we do get one off referrals to handle a transaction, and that's the start of the relationship, um, both on the sell side and the buy side. Um, you know, for for uh, selfish reasons, it's always better, of course, to represent a buyer because when we do represent buyers, then we're not selling off a client, right? So uh, very frequently, we we represent a buyer and then um, continue to represent that that target company and the acquirer for kind of general corporate work, labor and employment work. On the sell side, you know, it's it's typically um, well, uh, we could represent. A, a company for 30 years, and then once it's sold, yes, we can still help on the you know on the sellers, the the former business owners on estate planning. But a lot of times, you just lose that client, um, and and there's no real relationship because the the acquirer of the business moves forward with their own legal team. So it's kind of a mixed bag, um, you know. And and I do personally do a lot of private equity work, so it's a little bit of both, right? So rep represent the private equity fund on acquiring a business do some kind of day-to-day -day work on the portfolio company and then say five to seven years later, sell it. So um, a, a mixed bag there. Greg, we've talked about culture and, and how important that is for you and your company when you're looking at acquiring another company. I'm wondering, do you have a plan ahead of time as far as essential must-haves or do you just go into the discussions and the negotiations and decide along the way? Yeah, there's certain must-haves for sure. You know, a company culture doesn't exist because uh, the business owner says it does. And it's not something that's dictated. It's it's something that evolves over time. And it comes through actions 
uh, way more than than words. And I think that company culture is like a math equation. You know, we have nearly 600 employees in our company, and within that, you have many different business segments, and you have different work groups, and each work group or segment, um, the people that have lunch together every day are their own individual culture. And when you take all of them together and you add them all together, you get the company culture. And so you're never going to have everybody be on the exact same page, but there are certain things that you have to have in a company like ours where people focus first and foremost. And so if we're looking at an acquisition that's not we can't change that. We can't make that work. You know, we're family oriented. We're long term thinkers. We never sacrifice the long term for a short term gain. Um, if we look at an acquisition where that's something that they do all the time, it's going to be very hard um, for us to make that work. Work hard, play hard is something that we take very seriously. We're a we're a light hearted organization that likes to have fun and work very hard at the same time. If if we're acquiring a business where the business owner believes in you do your job for eight hours and you go home and that's the way it's been for 10 years or 20 years, we're going to have a very hard time making that work at Dave Jones. So you do have to have flexibility in culture and know that it's always evolving and that's not a bad thing, but it has to be evolving in a positive manner and not against the things that you believe in your very core as a business and as a person. I think that's a great answer. And I agree because I think it has to be organic. And Dara, you know, when we first talked a couple of weeks ago, I basically was trying to say what Greg just said, that to go in and try and impose it is doesn't work. It's contrived and clumsy and it, you'll never get the, you never get what you, you want out of it. Louie, you talked a little bit about how you've been on both sides of a business transaction, both um, merger acquisition and also um, uh, sales. I would imagine building a business that's attractive to outside sellers takes a lot of time and and commitment. Um, what did you find was some of the hardest things to manage as the company grew over time, and how have you been able to successfully manage your time and energy? No surprise here, cash. Um, you need a great banking partner. There's always constant competition for the cash, whether it's in terms of acquisitions. And when I say acquisitions, I mean in terms of practices, sites, people, equipment or technology. They're all competing for cash to grow that business. And you, that's the fuel that you need uh, to grow that business. And, and again, as you see, as a bank sees, we're growing revenue but we're not putting a lot of cash in the coffers. Um, just as a accrual accounting would tell us, hey, there's a great indication that there's a lot of cash coming down the road, but you're not even really thinking about that. You're just thinking about getting bigger, better, stronger, et cetera, more, more deals, et cetera. And, and obviously, you know, Matthew would say, that's what's really attracting, that's what is attracting you to those outside purchasers. They wanna, they wanna buy those future cash flows. Um, but you got to get to that point. And again, without a great banking partner, you're you're not. And you need that. A great banking partner, in my mind, is one that really understands your business and how you're going to get to that point and trust in you with that. The other huge issue, uh, obviously, for, for growing your business like this is your time, as you just mentioned. What do you do? How do you split your time? You have to realize that as you grow your business, you have to start getting more and more removed from different um different tasks that are out there and different people. And I must say one of the hardest parts wasn't so much for me, as I said, back in the Marine Corps, I learned a lot about this um, task organization. You give people their work um, and you make sure that they get it done. That's your job. But it's really hard on the people that are doing the work when you grow your company. And as I said, I started in my basement and I didn't have my first employee until three years into it, and I probably should have done that much earlier. Now we have uh, over 300 employees. It's very difficult for an employee who was very close to the flame, if you will, to get farther and farther away. Because when you grow your business, what ends up happening is you start introducing people. Selfishly, you look at it and say, what are things that I could find other people to do for myself? And you start introducing mid-level leaders or even upper level, you know, senior vice presidents, et cetera. So the people that started out with you and were with you for a long time, they might be in a particular area where there isn't 
as much growth opportunity. Just because you started out and had a project manager doesn't mean that project managers end up going to end up being your senior vice president of construction, right? Everybody has their place. Um, and, and often it's very difficult for those people to understand. So you have to manage that process to back to Greg had great points about people is the hardest thing in any business. There's just not enough people out there right now in any particular business, frankly. So you want to you want to retain the very best, keep people happy, et cetera. So you have to figure out ways to have those touch points, et cetera, because it, it it's just hard on people's it's, it's hard on people's emotions. When, when you start growing and you start getting larger. So I think that was probably one of the most difficult things out there to, to manage. I would very much like to thank Greg Jones and Louis Lang and Matthew Peterson for joining us. It's been a really interesting discussion about business growth. Um, I just have one final question and for any of you, do we think that this current environment is going to continue? Or Matthew, how, how much longer do you see this flurry of activity happening? Uh, it's a great question. I, I would say I, I I hope so for uh, some period of time, as long as it, uh, it can have some level of reasonableness to it. Um, impossible to predict the future. I would say that the general um, general feeling around the office and our M and A group, and talking to investment bankers, you know, just talking to M and A professionals. Um, I would say right now there's really no end in sight. Um, there was with, with uh, President Biden's initial proposal for increases in capital gains tax rates, there was some thought that, well, this is going to be a race to December 31 of getting deals done. Um, and, and in 2022, there might be a significant drop off uh, because of the dramatic proposed increase. The most recent proposal is not as scary. Um, there is an increase in capital gains rates in the new proposal with retroactive uh, applicability. So there's no longer this sense of, uh, well, first of all, I should say that it has not passed yet, but there's still the, the, the sense that there's a race to get deals done in calendar year 2021. Um, uh, at least a large chunk of that thought is kind of dying off. So we see no reason. We certainly expect a very busy end of uh, fourth quarter here, um, but we really don't see reason for it to die off uh, significantly uh, in, in first quarter of 2022 either. I'd agree with what Matthew, Matthew's saying on this. I don't see any, I don't see it ending anytime soon with the low interest rate environment and, and all the things going on the macro level. Um, the scarcity of, of people um, I think drives a lot of this as, as well, and I say it drives it in the sense of earlier comments that the larger companies acquiring things, they're searching for people and they're searching for cash flow. They want to grow their, their business, and there's a limiting factor on that that's going to draw this out. They can't acquire enough right now to make this happen, so I think this is years in the coming. I don't know. That's my opinion on it, that it, it's just not... There's, there's more appetite than there is transaction, and there's more people that want to do it than are able to execute the transactions at this time. So it's it's going to be a long time coming. Um, we're going to see this environment for, for quite a long time, I think. Louis just made a good point, and it was, a, it was an omission from this morning's call about the driving forces of why we're in such a, a robust M&A market. And a big one is the interest rate environment. And we expect the same thing from our standpoint. We expect that labor is going to continue to be very tight. So if we want to take on a new strategic initiative or a new market or to scale our company more quickly, acquisition is going to be key. Uh, to what we're doing going forward. And Greg, I also wanted to say, I think you have a, you guys have a great model because as I mentioned earlier, we're building in projects in 21 states. We'd love to have subcontractors that can travel. That's a unique model that they're putting together there. And again, it's extremely attractive to general contractors that you can have trusted resources that will travel with you into to new environments. Um, we do some self-perform on, on the carpentry side, but back, we've all but given up on, on trying to expand that business because there's just nobody going into the trades. It's, it's an acute problem. 
Yeah, and it's hard for general contractors to find trades that they can trust. And and that's one of the unexpected things we've seen from Indianapolis is we already have customers down there who are, are regional and national, which we don't have a lot of in Wisconsin. And they've already asked us to go to, to neighboring markets in Ohio or Michigan or Illinois. Um, so for us to be able to do that, I think acquisition is, is going to be key. Thank you to Louis Lang, Matthew Peterson, and Greg Jones for joining us for this very interesting discussion about business success stories. Really appreciate all of your time. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you found this discussion insightful. If you haven't already, please also take a look at our firstbusiness.bank website where you can find another panel discussion on successful business exits. And if there's anything that our private wealth team can do to help you, please reach out to us.